Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, some familiar faces. Uh, thank you for taking the time on the Saturday morning to um, come and listen to me. And thank you for organizing this great program. And it's a privilege to be here. So I am uh, Mazafar Kazabash, uh, uh, work at MD Anderson, uh, uh, work with Dr. Lowski and other colleagues in the Department of uh, um, Lymphoma and Myeloma. So. I am going to talk about uh, some basic principles of uh, stem cell transplantation. And then uh, I think uh, I was given uh, the specific task of addressing three issues. One, uh, transplant in this era of emerging cellular and immunotherapies. Uh, uh, second, also about the future of transplant uh, uh, is what, uh, and then uh, of course, uh, on the process of stem cell transplant at MD Anderson and how the team uh, works together. So first, uh, and many of you are familiar with the basic principles of stem cell transplantation and for multiple myeloma, it's predominantly autologous stem cell transplant using your own stem cells that, that many of you have done already. And the basic principle is uh, generally the high doses of chemo and radiation therapy. Uh, uh, so which one would be? Okay, all right. Okay. No, 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 I'm not talking about the advancing. I'm actually uh, talking about some kind of arrow or pointer, basically. Okay, that's all right. Am I going forward or back? All right. Okay, let's uh, go back to where I was, uh, the basic principle. Okay, that's fine. So I won't uh, use this. So, uh, so basically high doses of chemo and radiation therapy to eradicate the underlying disease. Uh, this high dose therapy also um, ablates or eradicates the underlying blood and immune system, uh, which is also the job of our bone marrow. So then uh, before giving you high dose chemotherapy, we collect those stem cells. So after that chemotherapy, we infuse these hematopoietic stem cells to reestablish the blood and immune system. So the end result that we hope for is we get rid of all the myeloma cells and then your blood and immune system is restored. Uh, and the therapeutic effect, the curative effect of autologous stem cell transplant mainly comes from this high dose chemotherapy, alkylating agent, which in overwhelming majorities, melphalan, an old drug, and many of you are familiar with that. Uh, this is different from an allogenic transplant, which is very uh, rarely used uh, in multiple myeloma outside of clinical trials, uh, but much more commonly used in other blood cancers like leukemia and certain types of lymphoma, where uh, our donor cells are used. And there the benefit comes not just from the chemotherapy, but also from the donor immune cells, uh, the so-called graft versus malignancy effect. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, if you could go back. So as I said that the procedure for stem cell transplant, uh, many of you are familiar with that before giving the chemotherapy, we collect these stem cells, which normally sit in the niches in the bone marrow. Uh, so we have to coax them out into the circulation. And we can do that by giving you growth factors uh, like GCSF or another growth factor called Plerixophore, and these growth factors can move these stem cells out from the bone marrow into the bloodstream from where they can be collected using an intravenous line and a machine called pharesis machine. Uh, in some situations, if we cannot collect it just with growth factors, we can use a combination of chemotherapy and growth factors, uh, which also allows these cells to come out of their niches in the bone marrow into the circulation. And sometimes we use chemotherapy to rapidly control the disease if it is not controlled by the prior treatment. Uh, after collection of these cells, patients receive uh, what is called the conditioning regimen or high-dose chemotherapy, and then the stem cells are given. 
Next slide, please. Uh, this is basically uh, the graphic uh, representation of what we just talked about. So the first part, the collection of stem cells, we send these cells to our cell therapy lab where these cells are processed. We don't remove anything or add anything. It's just the processing, adding of preservative. So these can be safely cryopreserved. And once cryopreserved, I have used these cells 10 or 12 or 14 years later on the same patient and they work. So as long as your freezer is working and you have used the right preservative and at the right temperature, these cells can be used later. And a lot of second transplants have been done with the cells that were collected uh, at the time of first transplant. And in some situations, we have used these cells for patients who are receiving chemotherapy or CAR T cells and their blood counts have not recovered. So we have given those cells back to them and then that has, this has allowed the recovery of their blood count. So then of course, patient gets chemotherapy and reinfusion of stem cells. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, these are the three questions I would like to address collaboration with myeloma specialist, although I consider myself a myeloma specialist also uh, at MD Anderson, uh, transplant versus emerging therapies, and is there a future for transplant in myeloma? So uh, let's go to the next slide. So first, uh, collaboration between myeloma specialists at MD Anderson. So, and many of you are familiar with this process that, uh, and that's true for any center, um, but here when uh, uh, a new patient is seen uh, by one of our colleagues in the myeloma department, uh, uh, they not only discuss treatment or start treatment, uh, those who are transplant eligible are referred to see one of us. We are um, all on each other's speed dials. Uh, if Dr. Alowski is seeing a patient on a Wednesday morning, I have clinic on Wednesday morning, he would text me that this patient is here from Louisiana or Utah or California, has to leave tomorrow afternoon. Can you see her today? And I would see the patient today just to start the process to get the financial approval, which can take a few weeks and uh, discuss the whole process of stem cell transplant, including housing and caregiver and the duration of stay and everything. Um, and then the patient uh, starts induction treatment under the care of their uh, primary physician. Uh, when uh, time comes for stem cell transplant, they come to Houston, uh, generally for about a couple of months, uh, uh, two months is the average stay for an autologous stem cell transplant. That includes time for collection of stem cells, testing, and then undergoing stem cell transplant. And then another uh, 10 days or so after the transplant for a follow-up to make sure everything is fine. And then we meet, go over the results, and then patients return home and then are followed uh, less frequently, uh, depending on what they require. And then generally we see them uh, roughly three months uh, post transplant. And at that point, they also see uh, whoever referred the patient from the myeloma department, um, because that's the time when they discuss maintenance treatment. Generally at three months after transplant, uh, if there is an infection outbreak uh, or, or a pandemic, patients can get their immunizations or vaccinations. So at three months, most patients after transplant have received their COVID vaccination. But the standard vaccinations start about six months after transplant. So we jointly see the patients, uh, the myeloma physician as well as transplant physician, roughly every three months for the first year. And that coincides with the uh, timing of vaccinations. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we have clinical trials in both departments, and we, uh, of course, depending on if we have a maintenance trial, we have the SWOG study that Dr. Orlowski is the national PI on, uh, and we, uh, if the patient is interested in enrolling on that study, we treat these patients uh, in the stem cell uh, department for maintenance on that study. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, one question that, uh, that I've been asked more or less throughout my career, uh, transplant or no transplant? So I'll go over uh, some perspectives. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, 
So this is a little summary of why I think transplant is pretty reasonable for those who are considered transplant eligible, which is another question, uh, but let's uh, leave it at that, that uh, for transplant eligible patients, why a stem cell transplant? And these are some of the points uh, that I make. Uh, well, it is safe. Uh, uh, treatment-related mortality less than 1% at any major center uh, with predictably reversible toxicity. Sure, there are adverse events and toxicities, but they happen at a specific time period and almost all of them are fully reversible. It takes much longer for hair to grow, um, but everything else uh, tends to get better faster. Uh, High-dose chemotherapy can overcome resistance to uh, sometimes conventional therapies. Uh, when combined with current myeloma drugs, it has the highest complete remission rate, uh, highest rate of MRD negative status, longest progression-free survival when combined with induction and maintenance treatment. Uh, uh, and some studies that have looked at some quality of life based on the uh, instruments that they use, they showed some improvement in quality of life also after uh, early stem cell transplant. And it still provides a platform for immunotherapy, um, including a use of antibodies or in the future T cells and NK cells. Uh, and it is recommended in most guidelines developed by myeloma experts. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, several, and why do I, uh, so what I said has been supported by a number of recent clinical trials. And these clinical trials have been done since 1990s, first with older drugs, now with newer drugs, newer combinations, and more or less show similar results. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so you don't have to read every column. Uh, what I can summarize here that these are all relatively recent trials uh, reported within the last uh, uh, seven or eight years. Uh, um, with, uh, and these are all European studies. Uh, they do large randomized trials much more uh, efficiently than we do in uh, United States. But almost all of them, whether the top two Italian studies uh, uh, the European Myeloma Network study, or the fourth one is the uh, IFM or the French uh, Cooperative Group study, and the last one, another European or Italian study, Forte trial that uh, many of you have heard about. And they all showed that when you combine stem cell transplant with combination treatment, uh, which includes a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory drug, and uh, um, as we will see with monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, and patients do an upfront stem cell transplant, it is associated with improvement in general in complete remission rate, the third uh, column, and progression-free survival. Uh, so because of that, let's go to the next slide. I will, um, this is uh, the Forte trial that I talked about. Uh, it was published last year in a, a major journal called Lancet Oncology. And basically they took three approaches. Patients received four cycles of uh, um, carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone, uh, four cycles of uh, uh, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, uh, or uh, and the plan was that in one group after KCD, they went on to get the transplant and then maintenance. And the other, they get a KRD transplant and maintenance, or they continued KRD for 12 cycles. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what it showed was that those who received KRD followed by transplant, the green curve at the top, had significantly better progression-free survival than the ones who did not or who received KCD plus transplant. So this was published very recently. And another very important thing, uh, because significant number of patients had high-risk chromosomal abnormalities. And what it showed clearly for the first time that a combination of proteasome inhibitor and lenalidomide was associated with better outcome than lenalidomide alone, especially in high-risk patients. So, so uh, uh, 
or the next step was, as uh, uh, many of you are familiar with, that these two studies, the top one in Europe, the bottom one in the US, uh, the Cassiopeia trial and the Griffin trial, instead of three drugs, they looked at four drugs. And same question, that, that will that improve their primary endpoints were different, uh, but similar question that uh, uh, four drugs plus transplant versus no early transplant. Um, and they both showed that uh, with four drugs and transplant, again, you had a higher complete remission rate, greater MRD negative achievement. And also, although the second trial was not designed to look at progression-free survival, uh, but there are some early indicator that there may be a trend towards improvement in progression-free survival. So again, all the recent studies showing that still, if you do a stem cell transplant early with combination treatment, you get improvement in uh, outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so based on all these trials uh, that uh, I just uh, summarized, uh, which show that there is an improvement in the depth of response, uh, improvement in progression-free survival, um, not necessary in all of those uh, improvement in overall survival, uh, the high-dose therapy uh, uh, and upfront stem cell transplant remains standard option. And this has been uh, a part of NCCN guideline. It's considered category one, which means that they have the strongest data from phase three trials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and similarly, many of you are familiar with MSMART guidelines, and they also you, uh, recommend upfront autologous stem cell transplant in transplant eligible patients. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, another important question uh, that many people ask, and it's a very valid question in transplant eligible patients, should I do it up front or should I delay my transplant? And that debate, of course, can happen. And there are clinical trials that have been done to ask that or address that question. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the top two trials uh, were uh, older studies, uh, and then the bottom one, uh, we refer to this on uh, this uh, modern treatment plus transplant. And this study asked that question more recently, upfront versus delayed transplant. And keep in mind that most of these patients do get their transplant when they relapse. In the real world, it does not happen. If someone does not get the transplant upfront, most of the time they never get it downstream. So a very effective treatment is not offered to many patients who could potentially benefit. And in this trial, what they showed, like most of the other studies, and we can go to the next slide then, that when people did early transplant, there was an improvement in progression-free survival, meaning patients stayed in remission longer if they did an upfront transplant uh, and alive, of course, uh, then those who did delayed transplant. But if you look at the overall survival, that eventually if they got their transplant late, their life expectancy was about the same. So whether you do it early or you do it later, as long as you do it, you still get the benefit. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so based on these, uh, uh, one can have that discussion with the patient, uh, the uh, some of the disadvantages of uh, delayed transplant are um, that many times patients are considered ineligible when the time comes, sometimes due to age, sometimes due to comorbidities, sometimes due to a more aggressive disease. Uh, uh, and for some uh, patients, it is recommended to do it early, especially those with high-risk disease, uh, because it has the best chance of achieving a rapid and deep remission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these were some of the arguments in favor of doing transplant even today with all the treatments that are available and those that are emerging because so far we have very solid data for transplant eligible patients. So of course, you will hear a lot about the emerging immuno and cellular therapies. I'll just briefly touch upon those. So next slide, please. Uh, um, 
many of you are familiar with uh, Ida cell or ABECMA, the first FDA approved CAR T cell for multiple myeloma. All I would show you here is that uh, for a new drug, um, when patients with relapse refractory myeloma were treated, if you would see a response of 15 to 20%, you would be very encouraged by the activity of this drug. Here, one dose of this T cell. You can look at the last column or the last line there. Uh, overall response for all treated patients, 73%. Uh, so 15 to 20%, remember, used to be. And these were the patients who were heavily pretreated. Uh, um, definitely more than three lines or median of five or six lines of treatment. And in those patients, 73% overall response rate, 33% complete remission rate. These were the numbers we would get after stem cell transplant. So to get that with a single dose of T cell is unprecedented. Let's go to the next slide. Even better, the second product, and again, you can never compare, that's uh, the conventional wisdom, that's the word, you don't compare two different trials as long as there was no head-to-head -head comparison, but there's a lot of excitement with the second CAR T cell, Silta cell, uh, and the results of CARTITUDE trial. I mentioned 73% overall response rate, and again, similar patients, about 100 patients treated, and you uh, look at overall response rate, now it is 97% and complete remission rate of 82%. So again, these are heavily pretreated patients, never seen a response rate like this. So that's the excitement. Next slide, please. And then you'll be hearing a lot uh, this afternoon about these uh, newer agents called bispecific antibodies, also an immune therapy. Bring your own T cells next to the cancer cell so, so those T cells can kill these cancer cells. Uh, and the, there are a number of these bispecific antibodies. And if you look at this overall response rate, when, again, most of these treatments are, uh, are started at low doses, and then you gradually increase the dose as they are tolerated. And again, you can see that these are heavily pretreated patients, but we're getting response rates like CAR T cells. Uh, but these are antibodies, so they have to be given in cycles. But then on the other hand, it's easier to administer because you are not collecting stem cells, which don't have to be sent for manufacturing and genetic, uh, and genetic engineering. Uh, next slide, please. So BCMA, of course, has been a great target. That's where uh, the two CAR T cells that I talked about uh, were targeted, and then, but there are non-BCMA targets in multiple myeloma also, and uh, uh, GPRC5D and FCRH5 and two monoclonal antibodies targeting them. And again, you can look at the response rates. So even against non-BCMA targets, you can get 60 to 70% responses. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> balancing transplant, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with emerging therapy. So we have great responses, great results with transplant, but we have these emerging therapies. So what should we do at this point? Well, so the current available CAR T cells, as you, many of you know or have read, are available for patients who have uh, had uh, tried multiple lines of treatment and three to four prior regimens uh, um, have failed to control the disease. So those are the patients who are eligible for the current CAR T cells that are FDA approved. Uh, so for someone who's newly diagnosed, this is what I would recommend, wait for the data to emerge. Uh, and those trials are ongoing follow current guidelines and recommendations and FDA labels. Uh, uh, and as you heard from Jenny, enroll and participate in clinical trials, uh, uh, which of course, uh, many patients benefit from that. We all learn and it advances the field. And 
what is the standard of care today is a standard of care because we learned from the clinical trials that were done yesterday, which led to all these improvements in multiple myeloma in the last 25 to 30 years. Next slide, please. Is there a future for transplant in myeloma? So like I was giving this presentation yesterday and I was telling that everyone has been after my job for 20 years plus. Uh, so here's uh, the bottom line that high dose melphalan, although very effective as we've seen the data is basically an alkylating agent, um, non-specific DNA damage. It works, but it's a blunt instrument. We know it works, but we also know the toxicities. We know its limitations. So with emergence of targeted immune and cellular therapies, hopefully with fewer side effects, when CRS and uh, neurotoxicities that you'll hear about, uh, um, when those would be fewer or better controlled, uh, and if they work as well or even better, yes, stem cell transplant may eventually be replaced uh, by more effective treatment. There are diseases that in my career, when I started, the most common reason for doing a donor transplant was CML or chronic myeloid leukemia. Now there is a pill for that. And overwhelming majority of people just take that pill and stay on that for their life. And very few patients come for an allogenic transplant. In the 1990s, uh, the most common reason to get a stem cell transplant was breast cancer. And then came the clinical trials, which showed that those who received standard therapy did as well as those who did stem cell transplant with much less toxicity and less mortality. So because of that, we don't do stem cell transplants for breast cancer. So if the data emerge and show that the other treatments are better and more effective and safer, it will go away. But until those data emerge, we'll stick with what the current guidelines and data show us. Uh, next slide, please. So on predicting the future, Philip Tetlock, a professor of psychology and political science at UPenn, also at Wharton, author of two books, great books, Expert Political Judgment and Super Forecasting. And he did these studies and look at that. Experts are not any better at predicting future events than dart-throwing chimpanzees. There was an inverse relationship between the accuracy of an expert's prediction and his or her self-confidence, renown, and depth of knowledge. This has been done for all the political pundits and all the financial market experts. And I think for all those who prognosticate and tell you what future holds, always look at this. So thank you very much for your attention.